morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, or perhaps it's afternoon. In any case, I'm my name is Kyle Hall, and on behalf of the co-organizers for Believe 2020, thank you for joining us today. Believe is a biennial workshop that covers the full spectrum of methodological discussions and visualization, ranging from novel emerging uh, design and evaluation techniques through to discussions on the validity and scope of visualization knowledge. And we really appreciate you tuning in for this uh, unprecedented variant of Believe. So Believe has a long history, relatively speaking, I guess, in this context. And it, the origins can be traced back to AVI 2006. Starting there every couple of years, there has been an iteration of Believe and it has jumped around from AVI to CHI to Viz. And for the last five years, Believe has called Viz home. And this year, we, we dive into the interesting territory of the first virtual edition of Believe. So you might ask, well, Believe, what does it mean? What is in a name? And like great organizations, I'll take the example of SAP or IBM, the exact meaning has largely been lost in the sands of time. And yet, so you know, we will take, we will turn back the clock a bit. When it started in 2006, it stood for Beyond Time and Errors, Novel Evaluation Methods for Visualization. And the idea was that Believe would explore qualitative evaluation and the role of qualitative research methods in visualization practice and visualization research. And as Believe bounced around locations, both in the world and in terms of conferences, its purview expanded. So as the, its purview expanded, eventually, well, during the last iteration in uh, 2018, the name was changed. And it now stands for Evaluation and Beyond Methodological Approaches for Visualization. Now, most of the time, we'll just refer to it as Believe for today. And those of you who, are, who have shown up, thank you so much. Well, we, we affectionately refer to people who participate in Believe as believers. So one of the key things that Believe has had uh, every iteration is a focus topic. Uh, particular, now, of course, today, like every other iteration of Believe, we will explore the full range of methodological discussions, but there's a focus topic that guides or inspires. And this year was no different. Based on what has happened in the world, we at Believe decided that we should focus on the COVID-19 pandemic. From a distance, research practices during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And this session, which we've just started, will dive into this and consider questions around communicating information during the pandemic to, to non-expert audiences, evaluation and how that's been impacted and design, how that has changed, how we can evolve. And it's a truly unprecedented time. Many of us have not, many of us have not experienced what is going on. Labs have been shut down, businesses closed. Many of us can't meet with participants in laboratory settings. We can't engage with domain experts the way we used to. We can't be together. Much that we held dear and almost took for granted now seems remote, potentially um, inaccessible. And yet we still have much to hope for. Thanks to modern technology, we can have this discussion. We can meet together. And a key part of Believe has always been the sense of community. And that is something that today we will endeavor to realize in the digital format to support everyone, no matter where they may be, in realizing and engaging with visualization, evaluation, and design. So before I dive more into the particulars, there are a bunch of people to thank. I am just one of the organizers. It's been a pleasure working with this group of individuals over the roughly, well, over the last number of months. It's been a great time. We also want to thank the steering committee who has supported the Believe organizing committee and the Believe workshop more generally during these strange and stressful times. 
It's been great. Thank you. Kudos to our publicity chair, Jen, who has, is, has been working hard to keep the Believe website up to date, get the word out on Twitter, and keep people plugged in to Believe. I'd like to thank the invited program committee. We had a wonderful group of individuals. The invited program committee in the Believe context serves as reviewers. And they were, despite everything that happened, they were timely, supportive, and just fantastic. Thank you so much for your contributions and helping Believe to move forward through these COVID times. Now, the Believe 2020 process. This year, we did see fewer submissions than in the past, and perhaps that was due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, I can speak for the full organizing committee. We were pleased to see the strength of the, the, strength of the submissions that we received. They were fantastic things. Out of the 11 submissions, we accepted 10 papers and used a two-stage reviewing process where the invited program committee two members of the invited program committee reviewed each paper, provided reviews, or an organizing committee member then provided a meta review. Based on that, during the first round, 10 papers were conditionally accepted. And we provided them with feedback in terms of modification lists. All of the authors addressed those modifications wonderfully. And following a second round of reviewing, 10 papers were accepted. And that's what we'll be exploring today. Now, the Believe has always encouraged a variety of paper types. This year was no different. We had three position papers, six research papers, and one survey paper. And today, we will not just focus on the, re the research and position and survey papers. They are fantastic. We will also uh, augment this with panels and breakout discussions. So the breakout discussions, panels and papers, what's the actual schedule for today? Well, here is a brief rundown. Right now, we're going to dive into the question of visualization in the time of COVID with our keynote and some paper presentations, then on to evaluation methods and extensions thereof. The third session of the day will be provocations. Here we will engage in some, well, we'll, we'll have an, some interesting, challenging discussions of where do we move forward? What does the future of visualization look like? Where do we go from here? We've heard a lot of people say that the pandemic has been an opportunity to reimagine what society might be like. And in some ways that holds true for visualization research too. And we'll dive into that and more, pondering the future in the challenges and engaging discussions thereof. And finally, we'll cap off the day with an exploration of design methods and extensions. So you'll notice throughout this, we have Zoom breakout discussions mentioned, the way that those will work is basically you'll be able to join the Zoom call at that time. And we'll give people a challenge or a prompt. And we'll divide all those people who log on to the Zoom call into breakout groups, small, maybe roughly five people, so that you can actually discuss visualization research, but get to know other people to, to really try to have some networking, have some spontaneous discussions that are so invaluable in a conference setting. So I encourage you to participate during those Zoom breakout discussions. And to get in, to log on to this call for the breakout sessions, uh, that, and just for reference, the Zoom breakout discussions will be in sessions two and four. You will go to the Viz 2020 virtual planner, and you will see down at the bottom there, that little blue box that says, you can join this session via Zoom. That is what you want to click. Make sure to use that to access the Zoom call for those breakout discussions. And also, as you can see here, I just want to remind you to log on to Discord so that you can ask questions to the panelists, to the presenters, and so that we can really foster excellent online discussion. So without further ado, we will dive into things here. And our first talk of the day will be our keynote from John Byrne Murdoch, Lessons Learned from visualizing the pandemic. John is the Financial Times senior data visualization journal journalist and creator of the Financial Times coronavirus trajectory tracker charts. He has been leading the Financial Times data-driven coverage of the pandemic, exploring its impact on health, the economy, and wider society. When pandemics are not happening, 
and hopefully, you know, this is, yes, the exception, right? He also uses data and graphics to tell stories on topics including politics, economics, climate change, and sports, and is a visiting lecturer at the London School of Economics. So without further ado, we will get this show started and I will pass it over to John. I hope that you enjoy today and I look forward to our discussions as the day progresses. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction there, Kyle. Um, and thank you to the organizers and, and everyone here for, for having me involved. Um, I guess it's good morning to some of you and good afternoon to anyone who like me is in Europe or further east. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking a bit about the, the lessons that we've learned at the Financial Times from visualizing the pandemic essentially over the last, um, what is I think now eight or nine months. Um, we've obviously been among well, hundreds of news organizations over the world covering the pandemic, but I think using visualization really to lead our work probably more so than any other organization out there. And I, I think um, I was tallying things up the other day and it, I worked out that we published more than a thousand charts uh, since, since sort of January, February on the data associated with coronavirus and its impact. So um, I like to think that we've learn some lessons along the way and possibly some lessons that we can uh, pass on to others to others here um, so this is the this was a, a version of the our coronavirus trajectory tracker chart um, from back in may this year when it was sort of at its busiest in terms of the amount of information we were packing into this um, looking here at the daily numbers of new cases in various different countries over the, in, in the world over time um, but i want to talk a bit about the some of the decisions that we've had to make um, in this chart and other charts along the way and some of the preconceptions I guess that that we as data visualization designers had about what exactly we should be optimizing for in these charts and then how that sometimes um, those expectations were sometimes actually upturned by the reactions we got from audiences through this process and 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 how we responded to that and a big part of that is because um, obviously with something like the pandemic, this is something that affects millions and millions, well, billions of people around the world. And so the audience for these charts that we were producing, instead of being the in the sort of tens or hundreds of thousands range of, of re people who would typically read an article in the Financial Times, we were putting this in front of millions of people. And of course, an extremely diverse audience in terms of its expectations for data visualization and its understanding and its literacy. Um, so that, yeah, that led to a lot of interesting tests uh, that, we, that we tried to rise to along the way. So I want, I want to talk about the, I want to start by talking about how I as a data visualization practitioner was sort of thinking about this at the outset. So the first version of that trajectory chart that we produced was on March the 12th um, or March the 11th even in the UK when, when the, the virus was starting to pick up pace in Europe and the question on everyone's minds here was, is, is the UK following the same trajectory that we'd seen in countries like Spain and Italy, who were a few weeks further down the path? Um, and I'd been thinking about this for a few days beforehand. I was, I was familiar with what data existed out there and, and was thinking, okay, how do we, what's the best visual treatment to, to respond to that question of pace of change, growth rates um, over time, and, and whether one country is on the same path as another country? And, and I think in that sense, I mean, I was thinking about things in the way that I've got on the screen here, thinking about precision, geometry, um, you know, thinking about this as fundamentally a, a question to which there is a sort of right answer. And it's a sort of mathematical and technical answer and how to get there. Um, and this was the first edition of, of that chart that we produced in, in early March. So we've got number of days since the 100th case on the horizontal axis. It, and that was a way of sort of anchoring all countries at the same starting point. 
Um, and then we've got on the vertical axis, axis the, the total number of cases that each country had had up to this point. And you'll, some of you may know that that is on a log scale, um, which I'll come on to the rationale, of, the rationale for in a moment. One thing I should also say at this point is that that, that decision of the log y-axis and the, the anchoring of outbreaks at a common point on the x-axis in terms of days since their 100th case, those were not original ideas of my own. So I should point here to two examples in particular that I'd seen um, around the same time as I came up with mine. So Matt Cowgill, who um, works for the Grattan Institute in Australia, um, had produced the version in the bottom left there, I think earlier on the same day that I produced ours at the FT. And then there's a, a health economist in the UK, Jonathan Minton, who produced some similar charts on the right. So there was clearly a lot of convergent evolution going on in, in how different people were approaching this. But just coming back to, to, the, main, to the main chart, so why did we go for a log scale? Um, I, and so on the day that we, that we published this chart, I, I attached a sort of, well, a Twitter thread alongside it really explaining why we were doing that while many other people at that time were still using linear y-axes. And one of the reasons was that if you, if you plot things on a linear scale, if you put an exponential data series on a linear scale, then obviously you end up something with something looking a bit like this, where you've got a lot of these curves arcing upwards ever more steeply. And it's, it, you know, it does a good job of conveying the fact that you've got something spreading exponentially, but it becomes difficult to project forward, to, to see, um, you know, where a country might be in a week relative to where it is today. And similarly, tricky to compare different slopes when all of those slopes are curving. And as I said at the outset, the goal with these charts was to, was to think about growth rates, to think about projecting forward and to think about comparing those slopes, which a log scale obviously does much better. So with, by pulling the same data, exactly the same data on a log scale, you, you get this fact that um, the same vertical difference represents the same amount of doubling, the same multiplication, and with an exponential exponentially spreading phenomenon like a virus, um, that utility becomes very useful because it means we can say, well, if, if, some, if case numbers increase by 10 over the last eight days, then what will that look like if they increase by 10 over the next eight days? Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, is the ability to compare slopes. So by drawing lines through the points here, we could look at, for example, the UK's trajectory in terms of its new cases um, and compare that to France or, or Italy or Spain and see if they were all on similar or different growth rates. So as I say, this was all about this idea of precision geometry maths to sort of get the, the best version of this chart. Um, and the, the goal we had, or, or the sort of the rationale as it were, was, was this idea that when someone's looking at this chart, the, the question that I was and, and we were expecting them to be to be, um, well, the question we expected them to have that we were seeking to answer was this, this issue of are these two, are multiple countries on the same course? Um, and then how many days will it take for a certain country to reach a certain known point of the virus, uh, for example? So how many days at that time um, would it have taken for the UK to reach the same point as Italy in terms of what we were seeing in news reports about the, the tragic toll that was taking? Um, and I think that framing also came from the conversation we had when we produced this chart, which was a conversation between myself and one of our news reporters, and she was asking me exactly those questions. Um, and so the thinking was, well, this chart answers those questions very well. It doesn't answer very, very neatly the question of how many pixels represent 100 cases, because on a log scale, that there is no fixed answer to that. But the sense we had was that that was not really an important question and something you know, that was a distraction. We should be focusing on its ability to convey that message. However, what we obviously saw then with this chart rapidly getting a huge, huge global audience was all the different ways that people began to perceive the impact of using a log scale rather than a linear scale. And, and this was particularly, um, this intensified over the months as the pandemic became viewed in much more personal and much more political ways and people were no longer looking at this just in terms of wanting to know what the latest numbers were but they were they were coming at this with all sorts of um, preconceptions and beliefs about what constituted a good outcome or, or what what would what an optimistic or pessimistic chart would look like and and all of this kind of thing so it became very apparent um that people were reading into our choices that we felt were these objective geometric technical choices they were reading in all sorts of other um, more qualitative meanings. 
So here's a few um, replies that we were getting on Twitter as we were putting out these charts. Um, these were sort of March, April, and I think into May. And so we've got some people here, um, I think a couple of these are British uh, readers. So the one at the top there saying, sorry, that log scales actually make it look like daily deaths are slowing down. Um, and this, this would help the government con people about the curve flattening. Um, obviously a very 2020 frame th there with the idea of governments conning people. Um, and so why, why were we not showing linear as well? Um, Worldometer is one of the other sites putting this data out there, which showed a curve um, that, that fit more neatly the, this reader's idea of what was happening to the UK's death data every day. Um, someone else saying, obviously they understand why we're using the log scale, but it would be great to see this on a linear um, as well, because again, the, the uh, sort of concertina effect, the compression of, of values as you get higher up that y-axis made it look like tens of thousands of deaths were, were some small trivial number and that the deaths at the, at the lower end of the spectrum somehow mattered more. Um, someone else saying um, that, again, this, this use of a log scale made it look like the, the virus was slowing down and, and this was uh, this was trivializing the outbreak. Um, now, again, if I was being, if I wanted to be argumentative here and, and get all mathematical and technical again, I'd say, well, that perception that the virus was slowing down was in fact reality. Um, if, you, if you're showing something on a, on a log scale, if you're showing an exponential increase on a log scale and, and the line starts bending downwards to the right, that means the rate of increase day to day is indeed slowing down. And that, you know, you could equally argue is a very important point for us to be conveying in these charts. It's important that people know that something, um, that the spread of the virus is, is, is slowing down. That's a good thing. Um, and, but, but of course, what people were doing here is that they were, they were getting confused between that slowing down of the growth rate and the slowing down of daily numbers of growth. They were hearing that numbers have gone up by 1,000 one day and then 1,100 the next day. And that therefore, this had to be an increasing um, rate of growth, whereas that wasn't actually necessarily the case. But again, putting aside those sort of nerdy quibbles, um, the point here is that people were seeing sort of political intent in, in our choices. They felt like we were um, downplaying the, the state of the virus at that point. And, and it became clear that we there were really two groups of people who were consuming these charts and they were doing so differently. We had people who were looking at these numbers analytically. So maybe people like ourselves on this call today, um, maybe epidemiologists, government officials, people who are familiar with working with data, they were looking at these charts and maybe holding up their fingers to the screen to measure um, growth rates and where a country might be at a certain point. But there were others who were looking at them on a much more, um, a much more visceral level. They were seeing them as a single message and as a signal that things were either good or bad. Um, and, there, you know, there are other cases where people have pre-existing beliefs, as we see also in some of those messages there, about the idea that the way, for example, that the UK or US government was handling the virus was bad. And therefore, if they saw the chart implying that um, things were perhaps improving, the virus slowing down, their pre-existing beliefs that, no, things are bad, this is going badly, led them to react negatively to those charts and believe that the use of a log scale was, was problematic. Um, so there was a, all sorts of, of qualitative and subjective things wrapped up in this that we needed to be aware of as designers. Um, and and that's, that's really what I'm saying here. I, I don't think it's acceptable for us to put something out there, even if we believe that on our terms it's correct and it's the best way of doing things. I don't think it's, it's acceptable for us to do that and then just you know, claim that we have no responsibility for the fact that people have then misinterpreted or reacted neg negatively to what we put out there. And that's why I think all of the framing, the communication that we do around this stuff really matters as well. Um, so yeah, all of this is to say that the, the, um, the process of making a chart may seem highly objective and scientific, but we've really got to be thinking much more as, as well about the sort of the messier, as it were, human side of, of this in terms of how, how our work is perceived. Um, and a quick non-COVID example as well of, of this stuff. Um, people will remember the um, New York Times needle that was first, uh, first used in 2016, so almost four, four, years, four years ago, almost to the day, showing the um, likely outcomes of the election um, as, as uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton went head to head. Um, and I think for most of us in this, in this virtual room, as it were, our recollection of that will be that a lot of people didn't like 
this visualization. People felt very uncomfortable with it. They felt it was stressing them out. Um, and it got, yeah, quite a, quite a lot of blowback um, in terms of that feedback. But I, from looking at other responses to this chart over the years since then, um, it, it's fairly clear to me at least that what we, what we were seeing again with this was personal and political interpretations of a, of a data visualization choice. And the, the reactions to this were based much more on people's, um, on, on the politics and the personal than they were on whether or not this was actually a good and effective visualization. So for all the blowback that this chart was getting on social media among um, circles of, um, let's say the more sort of, well, people who didn't vote for Donald Trump. Um, if you look at forums uh, of people who supported Trump, there was actually effusive praise for that visualization. People, people really thought it was a, a wonderful way of showing what was happening. And then the, the flip side of that is that when the visualization was reintroduced for um, some primary elections in 2017, um, primary elections that the Democratic candidates ended up winning in, um, the, re the responses from people with those political views were much more positive. All glory to NYT Needle. I'm liking the NYT Needle looking better just now. So it was quite clear that the visualization was being um, evaluated, whether in 2016 on, on the presidential election night or in 2017 on the primary night that the Democrats won. It was being at the, the people's um, views as to whether this was a good visualization or not were heavily colored by the, the broader context. So just like with COVID, um, I think we really need to be thinking about thinking about that and how our audience are going to perceive things when we put stuff out there. Um, another, another challenge that we've had with our COVID data at the FT is this idea of blinding the audience with science. So for those who aren't familiar with the phrase, I'm sure most people are, this is, you know, when we, we go into something too complex or technical in such a way that a lot of our audience actually gets lost. And as I say, when we've got an audience here of millions of people around the world, many of whom are not especially data or visualization literate. That's something I think we have to be acutely aware of. Um, so the question we had here was, how do we visualize extremely noisy data, which is what this COVID data of, of countries reporting their case numbers every day is, um, such that we're showing these, these medium term trends, these sort of weak scale trends, which are very, very important, clearly, um, and also being as faithful as possible to the true numbers. Um, so what I mean by that, the true data for people who, who haven't been digging around with these numbers themselves, this is what the daily level data looks like that we get from places like the Centers for Disease Control, Johns Hopkins, um, and so on, on new confirmed cases in different countries around the world. It's extremely, extremely spiky data. And that's because the, the data points that we get every day are colored or shaped much more by how the countries count these numbers than by the actual underlying trends. Every country pretty much in the world has very weakly, strong weekly cyclicality, for example, because far more um, cases, far more tests are processed Monday to Friday than Saturday and Sunday. So there's a huge amount of noise in the underlying data that is reported to these aggregators. Um, so what we, would, what we were doing for weeks um, and have been doing for months is using a seven day rolling average to smooth those lines and get around, get around that issue. And obviously this, this does a good job of, of ironing out some of that noise and ironing out particularly those weekly patterns of cyclicality, because if you average over seven days, you adjust for that. But the problem with the seven day average is that when you've got a series which is increasing constantly, or as it was in the summer, decreasing constantly, your, your seven, your, the average of those latest seven days is always gonna be out of sync. So if the numbers are climbing steadily upwards, your latest seven day average point is always gonna be considerably lower than the latest individual point that a lot, of the, a lot of the readers, a lot of your audience has probably just heard on the news. And so there's that slight disconnect between what they know that the latest days number is and what this lagging seven day average looks like. So one thing we tried, um, I think this was sort of mid April time was to use a smoothing spline instead of a seven day rolling average. So to use essentially locally weighted regression such that we would still smooth out the noise, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily be lagging um, anymore the, the very most recent data. We would get these sort of smoother shapes of what was going on. Um, and the justification for using that method is, um, what I'm showing here is depending on whether we were using a rolling average on the left or a smoothing a locally weighted regression on the right, the, 
the distance between the actual latest daily figure reported in each country and the latest day in each of these smoothing methods, that difference was smaller if we used a smoothing spline than it was if we used a rolling seven day average. So this again was me thinking about this in a very technical mathematical way to try and get it the best way of doing things. Um, and I then asked, asked, asked people, um, what do they think? Do they, do they prefer the rolling average that irons out the, uh, irons out the false precision of, of daily data and highlights the medium term trends? Or do they like the spline because we have that smoothness, but we're also faithful to that day's reported data point? And um, just like clockwork, of course, the responses to this were extremely divided. Um, so what we've got here is a few responses, again, from people who put things out on Twitter. So we've got um, two data scientists in the upper left saying the spline is, is the winner, because obviously for someone who thinks about these things in quantitative ways, that, that's an obvious choice. We've then got a non-data scientist in the upper right saying the rolling average is much easier for the average person to understand because they can compute exactly how that number is arrived at. They don't think that there's any sort of chicanery going along behind the scenes. Um, similarly, in the lower left, we have um, Rupert Beale is actually one of the lead epidemiologists in the UK doing a lot of um, testing on, on COVID. And even a technically minded person such as himself was saying that, yes, this is for the general public and a rolling average is much easier for people to get their head around than the idea of some um, locally weighted smoothing being done. And then on the lower right, we've got, again, someone saying that if we're, if we're aiming this at, the ma at a mass general audience, then a rolling average people are going to be a lot more comfortable with. And, and also making an important point there that um, most people don't usually have to understand things like splines and locally weighted regressions, and there's no reason they should. So, so using a rolling average is not about dumbing things down here. Um, it's, it's simply about um, using, using a method which is going to be easier for the average person to understand. Um, so yeah, the lesson there really was that ease of understanding has to be our, our our single most important goal as data visualization practitioners. We might have found some more mathematically correct way of doing things, but if that is losing some of our audience along the way, then that's a mistake. Um, and the second part of that is that if we are going to use something more complex, it's actually, and you know, there's, a, there's definitely a debate to be had here, so I welcome questions on this point, but I think it's best to do that discreetly in terms of um, hiding the explanations and jargon, maybe for only for those who ask, because I think what I had done by by sort of fronting up and asking people whether they prefer the rolling average or the spline was I'd introduced a lot of complexity that was perhaps off-putting to people who weren't familiar with those terminologies. Whereas if I'd simply gone ahead and used the spline without asking people, of course you can, you know, I'm not saying that we should all ignore user research, but that by not going into all of that technical detail, we may actually have not lost people along the way. Um, and all of that is essentially me and our team at the FT coming to the same conclusion that um, someone like Klaus Wilkie, who, who's some of you um, on the call might, might know, um, another data visualization practitioner and teacher. Um, this is a, a line from Klaus's book on the fundamentals of data visualization on the point that there, it's easy for us to obsess over technical, um, technical issues, uh, geometry and mathematical precision because those are much more neatly optimizable and there's a much nicer feedback mechanism in optimizing for those than thinking more about the fundamentals of how people perceive visualization so as Klaus put it a visualization that's mathematically correct but not properly perceived is just not that useful in practice and that's definitely I think an important thing to think about with both log scales and in this case those those smoothing lines um, but to give you an example of that, that second point there about if, if we are going to use these methods, these more technical methods, it may be better just to plow on ahead and use them without actually explaining what's going on under the hood for, risk, for fear of uh, putting people off. So I then did that a month or so ago when we were doing a follow up piece looking at what's happened in Cape Town in South Africa and in Manaus in Brazil. Um, and what you can see here is, again, two two different ways of, or three different ways, sorry, of looking at this data. So we've got um, the gray line is the raw daily numbers, which you can, again, you can see here are extremely, extremely noisy um, because, of, because of, again, reporting patterns rather than 
what's actually going on in the data. Um, and you can then see the blue line, which is a seven day rolling average, but because of quite how noisy the raw data is, even that blue line has remained, has remained quite noisy, quite bumpy in ways that could imply that something had fundamentally changed when it hadn't. So in this case, what we did choose to go with the locally weighted spline, that red line here you can see, which is much smoother. Um, and we went for this graphic and you can see those, those data points on the, on the left hand panel here. Um, and the key thing here is we went for that spline without going into a lengthy discussion of it um, on social media or in the story itself. And we didn't get a single response from anyone saying that they, they hadn't understood. Now, of course, that, that doesn't mean that it was necessarily the right thing to do, because if, if, we, if we had been deliberately setting out to mislead and we'd done something wrong with this data, we'd done something bad with this data, then equally, we might never have had anyone calling us out because they wouldn't have known. But I think it does at least demonstrate that if one is, is being very careful in what methods you're using, what analysis you're doing, and making sure that it is objectively and mathematically the right choice, then sometimes it's, you, you actually benefit from not drawing attention to the methodology that you've used. Because in, doing, in, in drawing attention, you might actually lose some less data literate readers. Um, this, the, going back to the log versus linear debate, that's something that's come up again as the, as the virus has been resurging in much of Europe and now in the US over, over the last month or two. Um, and we've, we now, we're having the knowledge now that, that people will read sort of political and subjective intents, or at least framings into, into which, whether we use log or linear, it's been really interesting to try and think now with the benefit of what we learned in March and April, wh which of these methods we should use today. Um, so using data on hospital admissions, for example, should we show these on a linear scale which will emphasize um, that the numbers we're seeing at the moment are much lower than they were in March or April. And therefore things might perhaps not be nearly as dangerous as they were back then. And this was, uh, this was a recent chart we did doing exactly that, for example. So this was new hospital admissions in England, France, and Spain um, per day. And you can see that the numbers in England and France were much lower. But of course, what this masks is coming back to what I said at the start, the rate of change, which in many ways is as important, if not more important, um, in terms of the, the state of an outbreak than the actual numbers. So do you instead use a log scale, which emphasizes that the growth rates um, are quite steep and we could therefore soon be getting back to thousands of hospital admissions or hundreds of deaths per day if the same trends continue. And so this is taking that same data, but just looking at the rate of change. So we've just got multiplicative change on the, on the y-axis here um, against the days since the outbreak started. And you can see now that even though that those England and France lines had looked much lower, in terms of rate of change, they are very comparable to Spain and England indeed may be seeing a faster rate of increase. Um, log scales, of course, also, also let the reader more easily, com easily compare the rates, rates of growth today to what they were in the spring. So this is um, a chart we produced a few days ago um, looking at hospital, the numbers of people in hospital with coronavirus in different parts of England over here in the UK. Um, and so we're highlighting here that the, um, the figures are rapidly approaching what they were back in the spring. But if you compare those slopes on each of these small multiple charts, if you compare the slope on the right for the autumn acceleration to the slope on the left for the spring, you can see that that rate of change is considerably slower. So that can act as some reassurance to readers that although things are bad and things are worsening, it's not nearly at the same runaway train level that it was back in the spring. Um, and this is also this, this use of a log scale to compare rates of change is something we're now committing to do as we continue to monitor the resurgence of the virus in, in autumn and into winter. So instead of just showing a chart here showing the acceleration in deaths from COVID over the last couple of months in Europe, I'm showing that alongside the chart showing exactly the same thing in the spring on, on the same horizontal time scale and same vertical scale. So we can see that again, although things are looking particularly ominous at the moment, that rate of change is much slower than it was in the same countries in the spring. So there've been lots and lots of challenges for us. Um, and I think for anyone visualizing the pandemic over the last few months. But um, the nice thing is that the doing all of this work has been very, very rewarding. And I think I'd, I'd, I'd certainly say that I've never felt more like data visualization is worthwhile than I have in the last few months. And obviously that there are, there's, there's, you know, there's the broader point there about it just 
it's clearly been really important to convey messages about public health to people and it's been great to be part of that. Um, but one of the other nice things is that both in our on social media and in our inbox at the FT we've had a lot of really nice reactions in terms of how people have been perceiving this stuff. So we've had um, people emailing in to tell us that they've actually subscribed to the FT specifically because of the graphs. Um, and this has happened, this was happening back in March and April, it's been happening even this month as well. So it's been a very rewarding process. As I say, a lot of challenges, hopefully um, challenges that we've come through by making the right decisions. But as I say, I know that a lot of the solutions that I presented there are um, debatable, they're arguable. There's a lot of different viewpoints that could be taken. So I hope we, we get some good questions on that in a minute. But um, yeah, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you all for having me as part of this today. And um, back to the, back to you, Kyle, I think. Thank you so much, John, for that fantastic presentation. We have a number of questions from the audience here and we'll dive into it. Um, so the first question here, how do we go about as viz designers considering the personal context that people bring to their viewing of a visualization? You talked about that a bit, how it was you know, affected, but do you have any more thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, th I think there's two things here. One is to think about how we use text around and within our visualizations to, to frame things. So if, if, for example, I know that someone is going to perceive the use of a log scale as potentially downplaying recent growth in the virus, then I can maybe caption that either in the title itself or in whatever text I have around where I'm using that chart and say something like, um, growth rates have slowed since the spring, but remain concerning, remain, uh, remain substantial, something like that. Um, and, and the alternative is just that, or, well, not alternative, but in addition to that, I think we should also be aware that if, if we are ever the ones doing the dissemination of these charts, um, we should be, we need to stick around as it were. We can't just put something out and then leave it. We need to sort of try and in, um, insert ourselves in the conversations around that chart and where it's being used to make sure that if anyone does have misconceptions, we're able to step in there and then correct any misunderstandings. Right, right. That makes that makes good sense. Uh, now, you talked about evaluating, you know, particular design decisions, you know, talking to people about splines, moving averages, things like that. For you, how do you evaluate the success of the visualizations you've made? What does success mean to you? Um, yeah, great question. And one of the nice things about doing this stuff while at the Financial Times is that we have a brilliant user research team who, who quite literally ask a lot of our readers exactly these questions. So we've something we've introduced on um, some recent projects that we've done actually is a, a Q and A at the bottom of, um, of the story and we're doing this specifically for visually rich stories and that is a series of questions asking people whether they felt that the, the content that they've just seen um, left them more informed, helped them to make, helped them to make better decisions, um, left them confused, um, anything like that. So we, we're trying to get uh, sort of more um, 
more high, more fine grained feedback on these things. Um, and we've also done a lot of work at the FT recently um, on things like focus groups. Um, and and we also we have our own metrics which track, for example, how much time someone spends with a story and how far down they're scrolling. And what we've found there is that stories with data visualization in, all other things being equal, get more and better and deeper engagement than the other ones. So we, we have a lot of metrics like that. And then and then what I do, and, and you know, some people would say, I spend too much time on Twitter for, for this kind of thing, but just, just trying to get um, exposed to a lot of feedback on, on our charts by seeing what people are talking, what people are saying about them on social media. Because as, as you've seen from some of the excerpts I've shared there, people are not shy to give us, to tell us what they think. And, and I've certainly learned a huge amount um, on that, you, you know, even if even if a visualization is ninety five percent successful, you can learn a lot from the five percent of people who take who take issue with it. So, so that's still a big part of it for me as well. Yeah, I think thank you for that answer. Yes, and I would encourage everyone, you know, if you have questions for John afterwards or want to follow up, please check him out on Twitter. He's prolific. Um, so uh, we have a bit of a hard hitting question here for you. Where is the border between propaganda? and hiding the method in favor of the uneducated viewer? Is it intent? Yeah, a fantastic question. Um, and I think I, I wanted to, I made sure that I did sort of hint at that while I was saying that as well, because it's definitely something that I'm acutely aware of. Um, and ultimately, you know, you can only, that, that, that all has to come back to trust. And so, you know, if, if um, some reader for some, for any particular reason doesn't, like feels that I am not trustworthy is it in, in my work, then it's entirely possible that they could look at a chart that I've produced and think, oh, he's probably doing something dodgy behind the scenes. So that's really got to come down to, um, you know, establishing a reputation as being trustworthy over a long period of time. Now, I, I'd also, again, add to that, that I would, you know, if, if anyone ever has a question about any of the charts I produced about why I chose to portray something in a certain way that I'm always happy to answer that so I think I think probably in terms of how what other people can take from that if if anyone is doing something like I showed with that local smoothing that spline smoothing and and what and and wanting not to make that sort of explicit for fear of, of putting off some um, less data literate readers I think all I'd say is maybe in whatever context you've you've um, shared that chart just immediately adjacent to that, say that if anyone has any questions, let me know. I think if people think you're approachable um, and you are, you're there to have an honest discussion and debate and, you're, and, and you know, you're maybe willing to accept that there are different ways of doing whatever you've done, then I think that's just a really good way to foster the trust that will lead people not to assume um, malice on your, on your behalf. Excellent answer. Yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, in terms of the charts, I know most of us have probably seen your work in online formats, digital formats. To what extent do your charts get printed and how do you decide which of them will actually feature in the printed publication? Sure, yeah. So um, we, we're still putting out a print product every day um, and there are probably, well, several dozen charts in that every day. Um, there's, so there's, there's essentially two two points at which that question has an answer. So the first is the, the print newspaper editors will decide which stories are going to appear in print. So there, you know, we publish hundreds of stories every day online that don't, don't appear in the print newspaper, but then the ones that do, if any of those have charts with them, some charts will go in. There's then a, a secondary discussion about if we only have space in the print paper for a, a subset of the charts, then which ones should we, should we choose? And we'll often also have to make those charts in print um, slightly less intricate. So perhaps it, taking the, the coronavirus data, for example, we might have an online chart which has 100 country lines in it because you can use interactivity to um, pick out the, the line you want. Whereas in print, we might just pick five or six countries that are particularly salient for that story or that audience. Right, that, may, that makes good sense. In that vein, I mean, if it's slightly different, how do you gauge, uh, you know, reactions to the printed collection? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar. Um, it's, well, it's much like online, this is through written feedback, but in, in print that comes in the form of letters to the editor. Um, and I'd say the, the only thing about that is that if we've ever make, made some mistake in a chart that um, 
that leads to a, a letter to the editor, then then that we, it certainly feels a lot more. Um, you, you get a bit more stressed out when you get a letter to the editor rather than a tweet. Um, but but yeah, luckily they've they've not been really much. There's not been much negative feedback to our charts in print. Um, but we do get into those discussions with readers as well, and and people as well will often email email us and ask about decisions we've made in charts, whether they're in online or print. Well, um, we're running out of time here. One final question for you, after all that you've done and the great presentation. Of course, COVID will be with us for some time still, and it's an incredibly important issue right now. How do you think we should go about making this information accessible to the millions of people without computers? I mean, there is the print offering at the Financial Times, but how do you think we do that? And what does that mean long term? Absolutely fantastic question. Um, I think there's two answers to that. Um, one, again, is through through print, uh, printed work wherever possible. So if there are parts of the world that are, are particularly digitally disconnected, then I think, you know, if there's any way for local governments in those parts of the world, if they want to communicate with people, then distributing leaflets or something, for example, could work. I think the more sort of scalable answer to that is that although um, ownership of, of desktop computers or laptop computers is relatively low, ownership of mobiles these days is pretty high. And I know that some news organizations, for example, in, in parts of Africa or Latin America have used WhatsApp um, and similar messaging apps to disseminate their, their newspapers, their news products in general. Um, and so I think sharing, sharing charts, for example, direct to WhatsApp, um, sort of WhatsApp broadcast groups in, let's say, the sort of less well digitally served parts of the world could be a great way of doing that. Obviously, you have the added benefit that WhatsApp is, by its nature, conversational. And so if people, again, did want to get into discussions off the back of this, then that would be the place to do it. Well, thank you so much, John, again, for the great presentation and for answering these questions. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to get your questions, get some, for those of you watching at home, if your questions weren't posed to John right now, please reach out to him, follow him on Twitter, and uh, we'll continue on with the rest of the, the session now. Thank you so much, John. I hope that you have a, I guess it's a lovely afternoon for you as we dive into the continued morning session here in North America. Thank you so Thanks much. Very much Thank you. Well, moving on from John's discussion of visualization of COVID data for a variety of people, we're going to dive deeper into the question of design. And so design during the co during COVID times. The next talk is going to be from Tatiana Losev at SFU, Simon Fraser University in Canada. And her talk is entitled Distributed Visualization Design, Challenges and Opportunities. We look forward to your talk, Tatiana. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Tatiana Losev. I'm from Simon Fraser University, and I'll be presenting our paper about the challenges and strategies for distributed synchronous design on behalf of my co-authors. So what do we mean by distributed synchronous visualization design? Well, to help me define this, I will point to a matrix that is that is discussed in the context of computer-supported collaborative work. This is the CSCW matrix. It's a table that shows possible configurations of time and place in which groups collaborate in. It's a framework that helped us to identify our situation and draws relationships from our objective to design visualizations to other collaborative contexts. As designers, we often collaborate by involving different stakeholders and people with different skills to generate ideas and iterate on our designs. 
Sometimes we work independently, but part of our process always involves doing some things in the same place at the same time, like design sessions in a lab or a studio. We found plenty of literature that discusses design process that echoes the kinds of strategies we typically use, like sketching and paper prototyping. However, they were placed in the setting where designers work in the same place at the same time, which is referred to as a synchronous co-located setting. This is highlighted in orange. When we were looking to adapt those design strategies of sketching and prototyping to remote work, we found there to be some advice for designers working at different places and different times, as is highlighted here, but our design context required us to be synchronous together. Distributed synchronous collaboration, or working from different places at the same time, is where we found ourselves because when we got together on Zoom, we weren't just setting goals and checking in on deliverables. That kind of activity aligns more with asynchronous collaboration. We needed to be able to collaboratively work through ideas using our familiar co-located strategies, but we found little advice about design process for collaboration in different places at the same time. This is why I'll be sharing the experience of our team through some of the challenges and strategies we had. But first, a little about our design team and why we were working in a distributed setting. Well, COVID-19, of course, forced us to work remotely, but more than that, we were a team that formed specifically to design visualizations of COVID-19 case data. This was part of a larger effort by the University of Calgary to deploy a public-facing website with the goal of supporting decision makers, public health officials, and the general public. Our goal was to think critically about how to represent the complexity of the pandemic data in a way that is accessible and not misinforming. Our team was composed of experienced members from different backgrounds, technical skills, and knowledge of public health data. They are listed on this graph as member A through F. Though some of the team members had worked together previously on separate projects, others had not. You can see this on the left side of the graph where team member A has connections with everyone else except team member D because they worked with them on previous projects, whereas team member D had only ever worked with team member B. The right side of this graph shows time spent video conferencing via Zoom. The size of the bubble represents the number of hours spent on Zoom, with smaller bubbles being one to two hours, while the larger ones are full eight hours of the day on Zoom. You can see from this chart that spending time together was very important in our process. When we looked at this data in the context of our design evolution, we see that the surges in our meeting times correspond with data discovery, ideation, and iteration of our design. To understand and to reflect on our process, we were able to use those Zoom logs along with our repository of daily notes, communications, reflections, sketches, virtual sticky notes, and learning resources, which are all stored digitally in Google Docs, our virtual whiteboard Miro, Slack channel, and email. This image shows how we went back and documented our Slack communications to get a concrete sense of our progress over time. We use the shared repository of communications and artifacts along with our own personal journals to then recall and reflect upon our experiences through an iterative self-study process. This method draws from autoethnographic and phenomenological research approaches that study human experience using reflective group practices. This is a qualitative research method common in the social sciences, but has emerged in the InfoViz and HCI communities as well. We found that working in a distributed design setting added friction to the process of understanding when interpreting domain-specific data, sharing ideas and sorting out the skills required to create data visualizations, but we also found benefits. In a co-located setting, we could, for example, compile our sketches on, a, on the wall of a meeting room for all members to view and discuss. We were able to do something similar in the distributed setting using a digital whiteboard called Miro, which you can see one part of here. Along with meeting 
on Zoom, we use the Miro board throughout our process and specifically as a collaboration tool during our design sessions. This shows physical sketches and some digital sketches made by our team members, but also use this as a space to put inspiration clippings and other visuals. We found that assembling them on the digital whiteboard worked well because we could arrange them and use sticky notes to annotate. We could point accurately at the sketches with our cursors and everyone had a good view. We could even copy sketches and physically draw on one another's work, which would normally not be socially acceptable. The digital space was also unlimited, which allowed us to keep all of this in the same place and refer to it throughout the process. Mural worked well to reflect on sketches, but we often use sketching while talking to express our ideas in a visual form. The process of uploading a sketch was too cumbersome while in the flow of conversation, so we often resorted to holding our sketches up to the camera during our meetings. Furthermore, we sometimes use the narrated unfolding of a sketch to share ideas. For this, two of our team members experimented with a setup of two cameras per person during a Zoom meeting. This setup included signing into the meeting twice with two separate devices. As you can see in the illustration here, one device was a PC camera aimed at the face of each participant, and the second device was a phone camera that was directed on their paper and pen. Though it was awkward to find a suitable angle and stabilize the phone, this enabled the two members to see each other's facial expressions, gestures, and gaze along with a view of real-time sketching. This method allowed the conversation to be held concurrently with a view of sketching practice as it was unfolding within the discussion. In addition to sketching, we also use hand gestures to express interaction and animation concepts. This is especially important on a team with diverse technical skills or when in the initial discussion phase. We discovered that the most accessible way for each team member to show their ideas was by talking camera to camera, similar to a face-to-face co-located setting. Everyone in the team with access to a webcam could speak to their ideas and show how they imagined the design would move with intuitive hand motions, facial expressions, sounds pointing to, or moving their own sketches or cutouts while explaining their idea in front of the camera. We also tried moving static design artifacts while holding them up to the camera. This emphasized a fuller presence within a remote collaborative experience. When comparing this next to our practice in designing together in our labs, we could have pointed to sketches and moved them on the table instead of moving our hands in midair in front of our faces. This sometimes referred to as paper prototyping, and it prompted us to create a digital paper prototyping environment using Miro. Here you can see assets from Illustrator were exported and used as paper clippings on the digital whiteboard. Video conferencing enabled gesturing and speaking into the camera, while the team members could copy, resize, and rearrange assets in Miro at the same time. We were able to collaboratively create UI mockups and animate them by clicking and dragging. This method was quick and inclusive to all members, regardless of technical skill level. Additionally, we found the ability to duplicate elements and groups of elements without disrupting the integrity of previous models provided a benefit over traditional paper prototyping. We found it challenging to create a sense of shared work environment in a remote collaborative setting especially in trying to emulate the context of a design studio or lab where synchronous collaborative work is essential. We were creative in our solutions to mitigate some of the barriers of video conferencing, such as setting up our dual camera sketching environment. What's However, cool? it was cumbersome to recreate and points to the potential for developing better ways to facilitate remote collaboration. While there are existing tools for mocking up interaction, these require previous experience and were not usable by all team members. When developing new tools to support collaboration,
We need to empower all team members, regardless of skill. We were responding to an evolving COVID-19 pandemic in our design goals, but also in our remote process. The need for solutions to remove barriers of working from home extend beyond the scope of our specific project. Design groups that focus in areas other than visualization could potentially benefit from discussion around supporting synchronous distributed work. This discussion can even extend beyond design activities themselves to the scope of interaction within the CSCW matrix. In conclusion, we think there is still important work to be done in considering distributed collaborative work for a range of contexts. We have offered our experiential understanding of this area as a step towards developing a better understanding of distributed synchronous visualization design and opportunities for future work in this area. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tatiana, for that uh, great presentation. And we're going to dive into some questions here now. So uh, I'll just toss out the first one here. Considering the challenge challenges and benefits of your distributed approach. When we are able to go back to co-located work, what will you keep from your distributed approach? That's a great question, thank you. Um, so we found that uh, using a mirror board is a really effective way to share artifacts and um, regardless if you're remote or co-located, you're still using um, computers to for resources to for references um, and that was a really great way uh, to share as well that that unlimited whiteboard space is is very useful so i mean building on that um what are you most looking forward to when you are actually able to do co-located work again what do you miss the most i i miss uh, I miss being in a room, in a physical space with people, with my colleagues and coworkers. Um, and I really love using um, physical artifacts and, and paper and, uh, and sticky notes and moving them around and walking about the room, something we cannot do in the space currently. Absolutely, and I miss that too. I completely appreciate that. Um, so through your, as you were going through this design process, one of the questions from the people online today, to what extent would visualization specific features have been handy and what would they have been? If you wanted, yes. Um, the visualization features uh, that would have been helpful would be ones that are easy to learn for the non-technical team members that don't know how to use visualization um, programs. But I'm not sure what you mean by features, whether it's software. I, I guess I'll rephrase slightly. Um, in terms of the, you know, you were talking about some of these things like Miro and things like that. If you were thinking of a visualization specific tool to use for your design process, what would you want to see in it? What do you think would have helped your design process? Yes. I would combine all of the uh, features of Miro and Zoom, for example, um, and Google Docs, and have a setup where we can have multiple angles on um, a piece of paper in our workspace, and to not have to switch between different platforms, um, so that it would flow similarly to a co-located setup. Fair enough. Um, so a related comment here, question, I should say. You clearly used a variety of tools. Which did you find most promising? Or, you know, you mentioned a couple already, but I assume you used many more. Maybe you can elaborate on your search. Uh, I, I really love the, well, I can speak for the, our team in the paper. We, we used a uh, mirror board a lot. Uh, we also had our Slack channel, I, I forgot to mention that, um, as you saw, where 
we were able to communicate uh, asynchronously, but the mural board stands out uh, as well as a pen and paper <laughs> because we were able to combine them uh, to have this um, multimedia setup. Well, one final question and then we'll need to move on to the next presentation. Any tips for what we should keep in mind if we want to use auto ethnography in more visualization research? Thank you, I appreciate that question. Uh, and if, sorry, if you can repeat, so anything we should consider? Keep in mind, they said. Keep in mind. Uh, there's a lot of really great resources out there. I think it's a really rich um, opportunity to, to do research and explore um, design and as specific to the COVID-19 setup, uh, it's a really great place to do research and qualitative research in uh, virtual spaces. Well, thank you so much. It's been great having you on uh, well, in our first session today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you again, Tatiana. Sure. Bye. Well, after that great talk from Tatiana, we're going to continue in this space of visualization during COVID times. And we're going to take a bend from design to evaluation now, considering how COVID-19 has affected visualization evaluation processes. And for that, our next talk is going to be Pipelines Bent, Pipelines Broken, Interdisciplinary Self-Reflection on the Impact of COVID-19 on Current and Future Research. And with that, I will turn it over to Priscilla Belstrucci. Good morning, everyone. My name is Priscilla Balistrucci, and I am a postdoctoral researcher in, an apply, in the Department of Applied Cognitive Psychology at Ulm University, Germany. So I'm not actually involved in visualization studies. However, I am part of a larger network of researchers that include many groups uh, ranging from visualization scientists and human computer interaction uh, up until psychology. And what we have in common in this network is that we deal uh, with uh, human-based research and user studies on a daily basis. Um, with the onset of the pandemic uh, earlier this year, we started discussing on the impact of the pandemic on our work and on the implications in the long-term and in the short-term that this will have on our work. Uh, while it is sure that the pandemic brought many changes in all of our lives, the social nature of the restrictions uh, that were put in place in order to combat the spread of the virus have profound implications on user testing because it is based, of course, on interacting with people. Just like all aspects of our life have changed following the pandemic, we also have to think about all aspects of the research pipeline that will be heavily affected. For the purpose of this, uh, of this discussion, we decided to break down uh, the research pipeline into five stages. The first stage is study planning that involves also deciding what we're gonna study, but also secure funding from funding agencies and talk with our collaborators. Next, we go in the phase of the experiment design in which to de decide how to, uh, how to answer our question, what setup and procedures to use. 
third, we go on with acquiring the data. So actually reaching out to our participants and collecting data. Then we analyze the data that we collected. And then lastly, we communicate the results of our studies into articles or conferences. In order to have a better insight on the situation, we decided to also not only base this discussion on our personal experience, but we also circulated a survey to the network of researchers in our fields, asking what was the state of their user studies during the pandemic. So we decided to circulate a survey online via social media or by word of mouth or just by reaching out directly uh, to our network between April and June 2020. This is when the lockdown in Europe and in Germany in particular was taking place and many of our uh, research facilities uh, were either shut down or uh, access was very limited. So in order to understand what how researchers responded to the pandemic, we decided to isolate four different cases. Um, in the first case, we had the, those researchers that were already planning to do an online study prior to the lockdown. Otherwise, we had participants that were planning an in-person study in a research facility, but then they had to switch online uh, or remote after the lockdown. Another case was of those researchers with, that were not able to switch to an online or remote studies during the lockdown. And finally, we had those researchers that were planning to tackle issues that were directly related to COVID-19 and the current situation. Once we decided where these, these researchers were fitting into our categories, we asked some more general questions about, our, about their study. So for instance, we asked what was the current state? So in which stage of the pipeline they were finding themselves? Then we also asked what kind of study they were planning to run, if, if it was an interview or some psychophysics or, or evaluation or interaction study. We also asked some more technical aspect about their study. So for instance, which platform they were using for data collection and the way that they were recruiting participants. Lastly, we went a little bit more deeper into what the current situation was bringing for their study. So for instance, we're asking what kind of changes they had to implement to run the study online, if they were able to switch it online, or uh, what measures they had to implement to run the study after the lockdown. In the case in which their study actually had to put on be put on hold during the lockdown, we actually, we asked what were the major changes, the major reason that led to this change. And we also asked things about what they experienced in terms of their participant sample, if they noticed any change. So coming to the results of our survey, we had 19, 29 uh, researchers uh, from different fields participating in, in our survey, both in the uh, fields of computer science, psychology, but also neuroscience, robotic, and R&D departments in the private sector. Uh, they contributed with 35 studies meaning that some researchers uh, were involved in more than one study at the time. Um, these studies that they reported were distributed across the four categories that we envisioned for our survey. Many of them, as you can see, were in-person studies that were not moved online. And when we looked more closely at this category, we found that the majority of them was put on hold, of course, uh, probably waiting until the restrictions were lifted. But some case, some studies were also halted indefinitely, meaning that they were not planning to continue running this study after the raising of the lockdown measures. And some uh, had major changes and a few of them remained uh, unaltered. So this is the situation that we found in general uh, on our participant sample. However, uh, when we looked uh, into what researchers respond and commented, uh, we can have a better idea of the situation and point out some salient aspects that I think are worth uh, discussing. Uh, for in-person studies that were moved online, a very common situation that we found is that they had to simplify conditions and basically in a way rethink of their experiment design in order to accommodate for this change in setup. Uh, that's because they didn't have the control that they were usually having in an uh, in-person setting in a research facility. 
However, we also had some different experiences. So for instance, there were people that were studying special or um, special populations, for instance, patient population, and while, and while moving to an online setting, they lost access to that, uh, to that participants. And we also had anyway some, uh, some positive outcome from moving the study from in-person to online for some of our respondents, meaning that they were uh, having access to a larger sample with respect to what they had before. Mm, for in-person studies that were not moved online, of course, the situation was different. Um, not only they were not able, so when they were able to continue, when they, sorry, when they were not able to continue, that was because uh, they had uh, needed, they needed special equipment that was not possible to replicate online. Think about uh, EEG sets or virtual reality sets and so on. Um, we also had anyway for people that were already able to continue their studies, we had found that they also needed to change the way that they were running the studies to accommodate for new regulations in terms of safety for both experimenters and participants. We also had some respondents saying, as we said, that we're, they were not planning to restart the study once the lockdown measures were, were lifted. What they did with this data, some of them we said that they had to work with the, with the participants that they had until then, meaning that they would not continue with data collection after the lockdown and they will go straight on um, analyzing the data and possibly uh, uh, writing a paper or presenting them. Other, on the other hand, um, were not sure about the outcome of their study. For, for instance, there were, there were uh, researchers that were doing a longitudinal study that was not possibly um, available for continuum because it, they might uh, lose access to the, to the patients or by the time that they are able to, to meet them again, it might be at that point useless. So as we, as we see, the studies that were originally planned in person have a high variety of outcomes and we have to consider many aspects. So not only the data collection going back to our research pipeline, but also on the data planning, on the experiment planning, and also in the data analysis and communication phase. Um, one main thing that online studies that were already planned online uh, might be less affected. However, what we found is that it was not the case, or at least that the results that we got were not unanimous or so straightforward. So for instance, some of our participants found that the timeline of the studies uh, was completely uh, affected and therefore um, they complained that the study was suffering from it. On the other hand, some other researchers welcomed this disruption, so to say, because they had more time to focus on the study. In terms of sample size and participant uh, recruitment in online studies, also here, there is no consensus of what happened. First, and some said that participants hesitated to participate in online study during this time, but others actually noticed that the sample size increased, possibly because participants had more time. So the consequences of the pandemic, we can already see that they extend over a wide variety of aspects, both in our life and in our research. However, while the disruption is undeniable, we should also see the singular moment in our history as an opportunity to reflect and, if necessary, to rethink existing norms and value systems. So I would like to finish by pointing out some aspects that I hope can serve as an input for reflection and discussion. First of all, some research ideas have to be modified or postponed uh, because they are not feasible right now due to the current situation and the current regulation that we might, uh, that we might take into account. So some of them, I just have to wait. Another point is that yeah, when we do plan our study, we have to take into account new regulations that have come to place, both in the hygiene, uh, uh, hygiene, 
setting and also in the privacy regulation, I'm thinking mostly about those, those researchers that are approaching online studies for the first time. There is also, as we saw, this delicate problem about the fact that data collected mid-pandemic might have a lower quality of what we were used to. This is especially delicate because there is always a pool between two contrasting aspects in research. On one side, there is scientific rigor that we have to keep. On the other side, there is a constant pressure to publish. This can also affect especially early career researchers. Another aspect that is very important for early career researchers is that uh, in network, in-person networking is limited, mostly because uh, because of the travel restrictions that we are uh, experiencing. However, uh, while these are obvious challenges, I hope that the surveys are helping us uh, reflecting on opportunities. Uh, first of all, while we cannot access some research questions, there might be new questions that arise, arise and that are triggered by the current situation. Another aspect is that if handled properly, online and remote studies can actually improve the generalizability of results and the power of our conclusions, because I'm thinking mostly here about what happens when you can expand the range and diversity of your participant sample. Lastly, we can also see that the communication of research through online tools can make it more easily accessible for not only for researchers in the field, but also for the general public. So we can conclude that we hope that there is room for exploring new opportunities with the ongoing situation. With this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Priscilla. That was a great talk. And I'm glad to see that you have really dived into this issue of exploring how people's processes have changed. So just a few questions from um, the Discord feed here. For the studies that were put on hold indefinitely or could not move online, do you know if some researchers were able to publish or communicate some of their partial results? And if so, how many? Or do you think that we've actually lost something as a community yeah so uh actually technically we didn't follow up with our survey so this is somehow a photography of what happened between april and june of this year uh from what i know uh yes i i heard that for some researchers uh there might they still don't know whether they are they're gonna be able to continue their study for instance in the case of longitudinal uh longitudinal study um I also saw that, especially in when when you are trying to publish or when when you are a reviewer uh, that has to understand the the quality of the study and if the study is worth entering the field somehow. Uh, I think that this is quite of a dilemma. I don't actually know firsthand about what happened in this case, but yes, I think that there are that is a pretty. Uh, interesting and also important issue for the future. Uh, a, build, a related question here, well, building on things, do you have any thoughts about the morality or ethics associated with asking people to participate in non-crisis related research when they themselves are living and adapting to a world that is in crisis? Did you consider that? Yeah, that <laughs> thanks, that is a, a very good question. Uh, I would say it depends, <laughs> meaning that, of course, there is always a matter of putting people at risk. For instance, I'm, I'm mostly thinking of uh, in-person studies. 
right? So yeah. when we think of in-person studies, we are thinking mostly on uh, yes, COVID-related studies at this point. But for instance, for many researchers involved in basic research, uh, it is not always the case. So there is always this, this trade-off or of course, safety is always first. So for my personal experience right now, we are not running studies uh, in person. Um, and we haven't run studies this year. <laughs> uh, but of course, since uh, COVID is not going anywhere and uh, it, it becomes an issue of what, do, what to do, not only with uh, studies that are not directly related to, to COVID, but all of the other studies that might actually improve several different fields uh, without, yes, of course, safety first, but we also might be interested in advancing fields. And since COVID is not going anywhere, I guess that we should find a way to do that. Right, right. Thank you. And I think you raise an excellent point, right, that so, as a society, we want to keep progressing forward. Um, it's well known that people take approximately 60 days to form habits. And based on what you have seen and the, how this crisis is continuing, what sort of habits do you think people may be um, developing in connection to how they plan and execute studies how do you what how will that carry out do you have any particular thoughts there um probably in my field i would say so i'm here i'm drawing from my very personal experience but in any case so far i have never really considered an online study uh, but i think that in many cases it might actually have some opportunities so once you're actually able to uh plan a study that that makes sense online and that can give you good results online. Uh, there are actually, as I said, some, some positive aspects about that. Um, namely, you have access to more participants. Uh, so I guess that in my opinion, in, in my specific field that usually doesn't do studies online, um, it's good that at least to know that there is that opportunity, that possibility. Right, right. That yeah. that's definitely makes good sense. So <clears throat> if I were to just repeat that, it sounds as though for you moving forward, the habit takeaway will be considering online perhaps first instead of an afterthought. Yeah, I would say so when it's possible. Yes, definitely. And there are things that we can't do online, right? It's that delicate balance. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you. Yes, and we're going to take a brief break now, and uh, we'll be back for the second session in a little under 30 minutes. So that will be starting at 12, um, 12 Mountain Time, and we'll be diving into evaluation methods and extensions. I hope that you'll be able to join us, and thanks again, Priscilla. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ecosystems are complex and dynamic. To investigate the dynamic nature of ecosystems, we have developed a prototype of a visual analytics system based on empirical dynamic modeling, EDM. EDM is a set of analytical methods rooted in nonlinear state space reconstruction. Integrating EDM with dimensionality reduction, brush linked visualizations, and visual summarization support understandings of ecosystem dynamics. We present the first generic design space and library for visual piling. Inspired by physically piling paper documents, visual piling describes an interface for spatial organization of visual artifacts into piles of partially overlapping items. Piling affords interactive grouping, arrangement, previewing, browsing and aggregation to reduce the complexity and support comparison of large collections of small multiples. When visualizing data in a realistic rendered 3D environment, it is important to represent the data in a readable way. In our work, we investigate how the opacity affects the readability of a 2D shape and determine useful opacity ranges. Therefore, we perform the user study with different overlay configuration like filled, striped, dotted pattern, the density, and consider the effect of an object.
we present a method for real-time ray tracing of stream tubes for fluid flows and diffusion tensor MRI. Rays are traced through a sparse voxel lock tree until they intersect leaf nodes which contain tube segments. This checkerboard pattern indicates voxel boundaries. Within leaf nodes, we can ray trace straight tube segments or ray cast curved tube segments. Our research goal was to design an efficient preview method of the parallel vectors operator through direct volume ray casting. As such, we present the first implicit ray caster of parallel vectors feature curves that reaches real time performance for interactive parameter exploration and preview by applying tensor product calling and a sectional Newton descent. As commonly known, dimensional entry reduction techniques and their interpretations are complex, biased and uncertain. In drug design, this highly complicates the search for similar and new chemical compounds. To overcome this issue, Canva brings comparison of different molecular descriptors and properties into one tool, featuring planar, 3D and table views for evaluating the trustworthiness of high-dimensional data projection.
Smartwatches can track a wide variety of data. We are interested to learn which type of data people consume and how it is visualized. To find out, we conducted a survey with 237 participants. We found a predominant display of health fitness data, with data mostly displayed as icons with text. Based on our findings, we discuss opportunities for visualization research on smartwatches. Smart graphs are variants of stack graphs with curved baseline, and the main factor affecting its reliability is the sign lorentz through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the string graph layout optimization. The result shows that our algorithms perform better than the others. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. In human brain mapping, atlases are indispensable to scenario imaging experts. While many of these atlases capture general trends over large populations, they fail to capture subject-specific complexity of brain organization. We propose Pragma, a tool for interactively deriving individual-specific brain maps from established atlases. Pragma supports within and between parcel analyses to help experts make decisions during the parcelation process. In this presentation, we introduce a provenance library, Track, which makes implementing provenance in web-based tools easy. Track introduces a novel storage model for web-based provenance tracking and has an associated history visualization, which can be fully customized. Track also contains multiple ways to save and share individual states or entire sessions of an application and ensures that explored data is easy to analyze in interesting and unique ways. Evaluating alternative interpretations is an essential part of complex sense making, but the resulting ambiguity is rarely considered in the design of visual analytic systems. Avalanche forecasters rely on sparse and human produced data to assess avalanche hazards, often resulting in ambiguous interpretations. We use simple glyphs and unit visualizations to specifically consider and support ambiguity in the avalanche forecasters' sense making processes. When developing a deep learning model, people typically struggle to optimize hyperparameters that are affecting the model performance. To relieve the pain of this manual trial process, AutoML has been developed as a solution. However, to maximize the potential of the AutoML, people should identify a good AutoML setting for their task. HyperTender helps to maximize the potential by visualizing AutoML algorithm behavior and guiding effective hyperparameters. After determining the departure timestamp, the experts then moved to verify the recommended shuttle stops and routes. Note that Shuttlefish recommends the default shuttle stops and routes based on the metric of average distance. Then they observed that in R cluster 4, the system recommends Hezhen Genyuan as the shuttle bus stop, but the experts identified that another drop off spot Pan Shan Huayuan is located in the middle part in this regional cluster. Programmers often make mistakes like this. A B S function is incorrectly called with a string. A programming language can catch such mistakes early on, but for this, it needs a type system. We present Typical, an interactive visualization tool for programming language designers. Typical allows them to explore common function type signatures and helps create a type system. Uh, testing environment for continuous color maps. Many other fields in the computer science do it, we should do it too. With our work, we introduce the approach of using test functions as a standard evaluation method. We present a test suite for continuous color maps implemented in the CCC tool. Adapt the test to your requirements at the interactive testing section and observe them at the testing evaluation section.
The visual analysis of large-scale data from complex systems such as electronic health records has become increasingly prevalent, but can be prone to a variety of selection bias effects. We introduced dynamic reweighting, a novel approach to selection bias mitigation that helps users craft bias-corrected visualizations. This approach is implemented in the Cadence Visual Analytics tool, which provides visualizations of, and control over, the dynamic reweighting process. We present an algorithm for raycasting Hermite spline tubes, which result from letting a sphere trace Hermite splines that define its visual attributes. Since we do not employ tessellation, our method enables smooth curves and transitions of radius and color along the tube. Join us for an in-depth look at the intersection routine that enables raycasting hundreds of thousands of them efficiently in real time and see what makes them a powerful new tool in the inventory of curve and line data visualization. Hurricanes, air pollution, forest fires, urban sprawl, ocean plastics, politics, traffic jams, and pandemics. So many of our modern challenges are geospatial and so much of our big data is geospatial.